Well, it's a pleasure to be back again this morning. Uh, I'll leave my full and formal uh, thanks to you all till tomorrow, but I have had a tremendously uh, pleasant time uh, at Moore and had some great conversations, not only with faculty, but also with students. And uh, thank you all for the questions you've been submitting. I mentioned the other day that one of the, uh, the delights, one of the things I most enjoy when I give lectures at an institution that isn't my own and is a part of a different, really a different part of the Christian tradition is you get, I get questions that wouldn't arise in my own context that make me rethink my material and uh, certainly many of the questions this week are, are pushing me to do that. So as I, as I rework this, hopefully for, for publication in some form, uh, the questions are proving very, very fruitful. Uh, yesterday uh, there was a, a, an unexpected acceleration or increase in the number of I had 17 questions uh, after the, the, the class yesterday. Uh, some of them, uh, a number of them touched on a similar theme that I'll mention in a second, but I, I, obviously I can't address all 17 now. That would take far more than the hour, hour and a half we have allotted to us. But I will pick up just on a, a few. Uh, one of them, uh, the first question was, has the sermon begun when the Bible is read? Uh, and I would say no, because what is a sermon? A sermon is presumably an exposition of Scripture, an application of, of Scripture's teaching to the congregation, to those who are listening. If you reframe the question and said, uh, has God uh, begun speaking when the Bible is being read, then I would say yes. I certainly would not want to, to say that, you know, the, the one place in the worship service where God does not speak is when the Bible is read. It seems to me that uh, the, the catechism is correct when it says the reading and especially the preaching of the word. The reading of the word, too, is, is I would say, a means of grace. Uh, though the reason we have sermons is that often, as P Peter himself says about the, the letters of Paul, there are many things in Scripture that are hard to understand. And that's one of the reasons we have sermons, so that as uh, Ezra did in the days of Nehemiah, you know, has the law read and then explains what it means to the people gathered before him. So the God certainly speaks through the reading of the word as well as the preaching of his word. Uh, to what extent does refashioning reality in the light of the cross require deep and sustained engagement with worldview? I would say it may do. Again, thinking as the minister of a congregation, I think that knowledge of, of your congregation is important to this one. A few years ago, I was asked to do a, a brief review for the Westminster Bookstore of Tim Keller's book on the problem of evil. I thought it was a good book, uh, but it was not really appropriate for many members of my congregation because you know, Tim Keller was asking the kind of questions that you know, people in Manhattan ask rather than people in a, a suburb of Philadelphia ask and was citing authorities like Kierkegaard that many of my congregants would never have heard of. So I would say, uh, does uh, refashioning reality in the light of the cross require deep and sustained engagement with worldview? Possibly in some circumstances. Uh, I think I would rephrase the question and say, does it require understanding the way the people you're preaching to think? And to that extent, I, I think the more you understand the people you're preaching to, often the better you can preach. I, to me, I'm more comfortable preaching at my home church uh, because I'm aware of the, the life stories of the people I'm preaching to. I'm aware of the difficulties they face on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm aware of how they think about things. And that's helpful in being able to preach uh, more appropriately to them. doesn't mean that when I preached in a church in Sydney last Sunday, I didn't preach and I didn't apply the word. I did. But I did it with, with perhaps uh, uh, less precise competence than I hope I would do it at my church back home. Um, how can we balance the preacher as one speaking God's word and the preacher uh, as, as one under God's word when we seek to give feedback? Again, good question. I think I sort of answered it yesterday when, when I was asked the question about how does the preacher preach to himself and then the question about uh, where, I, where I use the distinction between hermeneutic of trust and hermeneutic of suspicion. I think to some extent the, this question depends upon us regaining a New Testament understanding of the church where elders are worthy of honor. Elders who teach are worthy of double honor. Uh, 
And I think in a, a, a worldly, anti-hierarchical way of thinking, maybe hierarchy is perhaps not the best way of talking about office in the church, but in our anti-authoritarian, anti-hierarchical world, I think as Christians we need to regain some of the New Testament's teaching about respect for office bearers. Not that they become mini-popes, as many sadly can do, but that we do have a, a respect and a deference for them as, as people holding office worthy of respect within the church. Uh, and if I think, again, if we have a, a good biblical understanding of what preaching is, we'll realize that it isn't the word of God in the sense of my sermons should be added to the Bible, but it is the word of God in the sense that it comes with a certain authority and should be taken with an instinctive trust, even as we search the scriptures to make sure that what we're being told is true. In short, I guess there is no technique I can recommend for that. I think it arises out of a proper, properly informed biblical church culture. Um, the late Sydney Anglican legend, John Chapman, once said to a young preacher after a sermon, there are eight people in Sydney who can preach a sermon longer than 20 minutes, and brother, you're not one of them. Uh, can you discuss duration, preparation, and self-editing? Thanks. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of wisdom in there in what John Chapman said, without knowing the precise circumstances, of course. I think every preacher has to find the length of time that that they can preach for. Uh, I, I often wonder if a, a generation of preachers in Britain were spoiled to some extent by Martin Lloyd-Jones because he could preach for an hour. And a lot of people grew up thinking that unless you, were preaching, weren't pre unless you were preaching for an hour, you weren't preaching a proper sermon. Uh, I find I can lecture indefinitely. <laughs> but uh, you know, bad news for you. Thankfully, Mark has set sort of time limits to what I do. But, but I find that my sermons, I'm told that my sermons all fall pretty much between a, a 30, 35 minute bracket. And I, I don't time myself, but typically I've, my sermons last 30 to 35 minutes. And I think I can probably just about hold people in a sermon for that long. I can't preach for an hour. I think every preacher has to find out how long uh, he can preach for. Um, and I think as far as the editing and preparation go, to some extent, uh, the, the form of life you have shapes preparation. I, have, I teach at a seminary and I pastor and preach each week, but I'm doing that part-time. So my preparation has to be somewhat more compressed and perhaps more chaotic and eclectic than somebody who can really devote a big part of their week to preparing. So again, I think that it depends on the rhythm of your life. Uh, and as far as self-editing goes, I would go back to my comment about elders. I think it's very good to have elders in the church uh, that you can discuss your preaching with. Um, usually when I come to the end of a sermon series, I'll take my elders' advice on what to preach on next. I'll go to them with two or three suggestions. And as a, as a session, as a group of elders, we'll discuss what I should preach on next. And in that kind of context, uh, you can get good feedback. So as a sort of formal mechanism, I think eldership in the church is a very, very good way of getting feedback. Um, I had a lot of questions yesterday on uh, women and preaching. Uh, to some extent, I think I'm going to touch upon that today. I would say this, you know, my topic, you know, Reformation preaching the modern mind, uh, inevitably means that I'm not going to be talking much about women's ministry. It's just the topic is such that in the 16th century that wasn't really going on, and therefore the topic itself is somewhat limiting uh, I would say, I think I would say this, and I, I hope I'm not sort of knocking over any, any furniture in this context, but I think having a high view of ordination counterintuitively helps at this point. Uh, it seems to me that uh, you know, my view of ordination is that ordination to office is, is a male-only uh, prerogative. But having said that, I would then say that pretty much anything that a non-ordained man can do, a woman can do. I, pretty much, that's a tiny qualification, because I mentioned yesterday that I do allow men students who are on track for ministry to test their preaching skills. 
So it's a slight sort of uh, uh, wrinkle there. Great thing about studying Reformation is that you realize how pragmatic the reformers were at points. So a little bit of pragmatism sometimes is very, very helpful, I think, in, in church life. But you weren't to laugh at that, but obviously you're all <laughs> horrified by it. Um, <laughs> Do I have any problem with women teaching women the Bible? No. Do I have any problem with women's Bible studies? No. Have I allowed a woman to teach Sunday school to a mixed class at my church? Yes, I have. Now, I might there be, you know, it might interest me to think about which topics, perhaps, or in precisely what context I might allow that to happen. Uh, but I have allowed that to, to go forward uh, in my congregation with one particular class we had uh, by uh, a girl in our congregation who worked for Wycliffe Bible Translators on the issue of text and Bible translation. And she was by far the best and most competent person in the congregation to speak on that. So while this week I'm focusing on sort of ordained ministry and preaching, I guess, I wanted to, to put that out there. Um, I think that's, oh, there was one, uh, a lot of these questions I'll try to pick up on my blog in, in the coming weeks and months. Um, there was one question I didn't want to answer. Uh, do you choose Led Zeppelin or Pink Floyd? Um, huge question. Uh, difficult to answer in 30 seconds. Um, the, the 30 second version is both great bands, obviously. Uh, I, and, and both bands disbanded before they'd gone on too long, which is another strong point. I think uh, Floyd, even for me, they can be a bit pessimistic at times. So I've got to favor Led Zeppelin, though, you know, Dave Gilmore, Jimmy Page as guitarist, it's a close, it's a close call, uh, to be honest. Um, I would say uh, Dark Side of the Moon uh, versus the, the first disc in physical graffiti. That's where the question comes down, and those are the two albums that you have to have to compare. Um, so, yeah, I was going to say, I wanted to thank Mark Thompson for that question, actually. But, uh, so, so, uh, so, anyway, lectures five and six. I want to talk now more specifically about the preacher and the congregation. And as I say, having just made that comment about women's ministry, I think that uh, you should be able to, to connect dots, if you like, towards uh, ministry in general, we might say. But I'm talking more specifically about the ordained preaching ministry here. But many of the principles, I think, apply across the board. One of the big shifts at the Reformation, of course, is the definition of the church. Uh, you know, the apostolic succession for the Reformers is not the apostolic succession of the laying on of hands, but is the apostolic succession of teaching and public proclamation of the word. And the fundamental mark of the church for all of the magisterial reformers, that's the mainstream reformers, Luther, Zwingli, Bullinger, Calvin, Cranmer and company, the fundamental mark of the church is the word and the word proclaimed. Uh, Luther says this in his great 1539 treatise uh, on the councils of the church. The holy Christian people are first recognized by their possession of the holy word of God. We are speaking of the external word preached orally by men like you and me. For this is what Christ left behind as an external sign by which his church or his Christian people in the world should be recognized. Now, wherever you hear or see this word preached, believed, professed, and lived, do not doubt that the true Ecclesia Sancta Catholica, a Christian holy people, must be there, even though their number is very small. For God's word shall not return empty, Isaiah 55, but must have at least a fourth or a fraction of the field, and even if there were no other sign than this alone, it would suffice to prove that a Christian holy people must exist there. For God's word cannot be without God's people. And conversely, God's people cannot be without God's word. Otherwise, who would preach or hear it preached if there were no people of God? And what could God, and what could or would God's people believe if there were no word of God? Luther's making there a very basic Reformation point, and that is that the church is a creature of the word. It goes back to what I was saying, uh, <clears throat> I think, on Tuesday. Uh, the word is that which creates. 
And the word of the gospel is that which creates the church. Goes also to what I was saying when I talked about the church as an act of God. The church is not a response to God's word. The church is created by God's word. It's not that we hear the word, believe the word, and then decide to respond by becoming the church. It's the hearing and the believing of the word that actually creates the church. Points, of course, to the fact that for the reformers, Christianity is, above all, doctrinal. Christianity is fundamentally a religion of assertion. When Luther clashes with Erasmus in 1525, uh, really the Luther-Erasmus clash, it's one of those wonderful conflicts in church history that that works in a number of different ways. And one way one can look at the clash between Erasmus and Luther is it's, it's another of those, is Christianity a way of life or a set of doctrines debates? For Erasmus, I think Christianity is fundamentally a way of life. In his uh, handbook of the Christian soldier, he presents a very attractive view of Christianity as Christ is a wonderful example and we're to live our lives following Christ's example. For Luther, that view is fundamentally flawed because Christianity for Luther is a religion of assertions. It's a set of statements about who God is, what he's done, what he commands, what he promises. And this, I think, is the great Reformation insight of the church. If you were to ask a medieval Roman Catholic, where is the true church? The answer would probably come back, well, we look for apostolic succession. The laying on of the hands that ultimately connects all priests to a bishop and all bishops ultimately to Rome and to Christ's promise that Peter would be the rock upon which the church would be built. And that connects also to the view of authority in the medieval church. Uh, Roman Catholic priests have a sacramental authority. Their power resides in, you know, I suspect a Catholic priest would not like it put this way, but we might say their power resides in the power they have over the sacraments. They would not like the way I expressed it, I don't think, but it captures something of the power of the priesthood resides in its sacramental authority. That's why excommunication was such a devastating thing in the Middle Ages, to be cut off from the visible sacramental communion of the people of God was to be cut out of salvation. Very, very powerful. With Protestantism, we get a fundamental shift. Protestantism, the church, is... I say apostolic succession, is the continuity of preaching and teaching that goes back to the apostles. It is a word-based authority. And I think, crucially, it is a ministerial authority. Protestant ministers and preachers have no power beyond that which they have from the word. The word is prior to power. We would say that the the power of the ministry is therefore ministerial. It is not the same as the sacramental authority of the priesthood. It is a ministerial authority of the word. And I think that the reformers here capture something uh, important of New Testament teaching relative to the church that was at the very best, I think, eclipsed somewhat in the Middle Ages. And that is that the church is fundamentally doctrinal. Romans 16, 17, Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Again, for those of us today who, you know, most of the battles in the church, we think of them as doctrinal, and often we think of those who emphasize doctrine as being the divisive ones. Paul is sort of saying the opposite there. It's those who are breaking with true doctrine that are the divisive ones, and they are to be avoided. What I think you get in the Reformation is a recovery, I think, of the, the model of church life that... Paul lays out in his pastoral epistles. Uh, 
It's amazing you go into your average books, bookshop, Christian bookshop, and, well, hopefully, if, if it's a decent Christian bookshop, it'll have a section on the doctrine of the church, and there are vast numbers of books written on the doctrine of the church. Paul, at the end of his life, as he's facing, uh, you know, realizing that the apostolic era is coming to an end and the church is going to need something more than the apostles to carry it forward, writes just those three really short letters, uh, 1, 2, Timothy, and Titus, full of very rich and important insights for the church. And I think as you look at uh, his letters, particularly to Timothy, though Titus, I think, overlaps significantly, there are a number of characteristics that Paul draws out that the church is to have in the post-apostolic era. I think things that the reformers pick up on beautifully. First of all, 2 Timothy 1.13, Paul talks about a form of sound words. It seems to me that he's pointing there to a tradition of sound words that is being passed, will be passed on from generation to generation. I would argue, and I have argued at length in print, that what we have there is the functional equivalent of a creed or a confession. I'm not saying that these things had yet been formalized to that level in the ancient church, but you have the functional equivalent of a creed or confession. You have the form of sound words. The need for that is answered by the church. I think in the early centuries by the production of creeds and continued in the Reformation by the development of confessions, reminding us, of course, that Christianity is inextricably connected to the past. We don't invent Christianity every Sunday. It's inextricably connected to the past, and creeds and confessions help us to see that. Secondly, and importantly, I think Timothy, uh, Paul points Timothy towards a structure of authority. 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7, Titus 1, 5 to 9, especially verse 9 on teaching. Paul points Timothy towards the need for some kind of structure. One of the questions I was asked yesterday was, how are you defining the church? Well, I think, you know, we can think of the church in a number of different ways. We can think of the, the invisible church, Presbyterianism. We think of the invisible church, which is the sum total of all of the elect. It's the invisible church. Uh, we can talk, perhaps, of, of church when two or three are gathered together in Christ's name. But I also think there's an appropriate way of talking about the church in a more formal sense, and that is where the tradition of teaching and a structure of appointed authority are connected. And I think that's what Paul's talking about in his pastoral letters. And that authority is expressed by preaching and teaching, which is regulated by Scripture. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17 it's connected to the public reading of Scripture, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 4.13, and to proclamation, 1 Timothy 4.1-2. I think what the Reformers do is they recapture the centrality of the proclamation of the Word connected to ministerial structures of authority in the church. It's a radical break with the past, really. Uh, you know, I often, you know, we often have this view of the Reformation, I think, that we, we have a romantic view because we like it and we think it's a good thing, which it was by and large, that everybody in Europe is just gasping for the Reformation to arrive. Uh, I don't think so. I think the Reformation makes demands upon people that many people would have found disturbing. You know, a religion where you just go to, to church once a year and take the sacrament and maybe confess your sins once a year, and where it's pretty much all done for you by the priest, that's a pretty good religion, humanly speaking, by and large, isn't it? I always think of Mormonism. Mormonism is the, you know, the classic American religion. You know, every man becomes a god and gets his own planet when he dies. That is America for you, <laughs> translated into <laughs> theological terms. The Reformation comes along and it places the word at the center. And it actually makes your belief, your grasping of that word by faith, the key factor. That puts huge responsibility 
on individuals. Put it that because just think of how that's going to transform pastoral care, pastoral, the pastoral occupation in the Reformation. So a radical change in pastoral practice and, in normat- and also in normative Christian expectation. I mentioned the other day the issue of assurance. That will become critical in the Reformation in a way that it was never critical before because nobody was expected to have assurance in the Middle Ages. Almost nobody. Only the super saints who had a special revelation from God. Once you make that normative, while you're changing the very nature of pastoral practice as well, you're setting yourself up for all kinds of catastrophic pastoral problems to which you're going to have to find new answers. So there's this return, I think, to what I would see as a more New Testament view of church. And that brings me to an interesting point, and I think a point that separates, often separates us from the New Testament. And that is the issue of qualification for office. I mentioned on Monday we live in a a technological age. I think we also live in what I would call a technical age where problems are solved by technique. Uh, just this morning, watch the, you know, the news is great for providing limitless illustrations of what's wrong with society. Uh, there's a big debate. We've, with the ba- debate's gone on in the United States. It's now going on here about the, the human papilloma virus and what's the best way to stop it spreading uh, among children. Um, and at some point, the, uh, the, the interviewer asked the, the advocate for this, and I, I'm not, I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing, that the, the vaccination thing, but at some point, the, the, the interviewer said, it is a sexually transmitted disease, isn't it? And the person said, yes, and then moved straight on to continuing to talk about vaccination. It struck me as interesting that we have there a disease that clearly has, often has, what we would typically have regarded as a morally complex context where morals never features as part of this this interview or discourse. Discourse is entirely technical. We have a problem. We can ignore the moral structure of the problem. That's irrelevant because we can come up with a technical solution. The AIDS crisis of the 80s, I think, was the greatest example of this, where actually those who attempted to inject some sort of moral structure into the discourse were decried as as hate-filled bigots or as living on another planet. We live in a technical age, and I think that one of the things that does, has done, I think it's crept into the church. The danger in the church is that we can start to think of office bearing, of preaching, of leading Bible studies, doesn't matter what context you're ministering in, as technical exercises. It's very interesting when you go back in history and you read the great manuals, the sort of the pastoral training manuals of the ancient church, even the Middle Ages and certainly the Reformation, how much morality and character features in the discussions. Uh, I was thinking, you know, if if you're interested in... uh, Reading some of these, um, Gregory of Nazianzus' uh, little work uh, on flight is worth reading. Gregory the Great wrote uh, a book on pastoral care. My favorite from the ancient church is John Chrysostom. Chrysostom's book on the priesthood, which has a wonderful, some wonderful sections on preaching and how to deal with critics of your preaching. Uh, And one of the things he draws out there is the ability to handle criticism of preaching is deeply rooted in one's moral character. If you love praise too much, uh, Chris Ostom said, you'll be a disastrous preacher because you end up pandering to the taste of those whose praise you crave. If you have no care for people, you will be a disastrous preacher because you'll never actually pay any attention or give any concern to concerns or criticisms they might raise. These books are profoundly concerned with personal qualifications. And of course, if if you look at, uh, again, Gregory of Nazianzus's first theological oration is all about asceticism. Now, I don't want to go the ascetic route, but for Gregory, 
you couldn't possibly contemplate ministry without thinking about the whole character and life of the person. It's the same in the Reformation. As the book is actually translated, you can, you can get in translation. It, it comes, it's parallel text. It's German one side, uh, English the other. It's translated by Scott Hendricks. Urbanus Regius's homiletical handbook. Urbanus Regius was a great Lutheran reformer of Nuremberg. And he wrote a, a handbook of homiletics. And his basic assumption was that an appropriate handling of the theological content of Scripture was at a profound level a function of the character of the preacher. For example, he talks uh, at the beginning, he says, For years now, with great distress, I have seen in many parts of Germany how often laity have been seriously offended by that confused, inept, and imprudent way of speaking when certain thoughtless know-it-alls with an inflated estimate of their own knowledge take no notice of what they say, how they say it, or to whom they are speaking. Take no notice of what they say, how they say, or to whom they are speaking. For Urbanus Regius, the character of the preacher, the character of the exegete, becomes evident in the way he exegetes and applies scripture. Just think about that. So what they're saying there, and he stands, I think, in a hallowed Christian tradition at that point, character. Character is important. Now, we might often think that character is important for the credibility of the preacher, and it absolutely is. And that's why Paul, I think, adds as one of his qualifications of eldership, of good reputation with those outside. The preacher's own life is not to undermine the truthfulness of his message. But I think the reformers are also saying, Urbanus Regis is also saying, that character actually affects how you exegete and preach scripture. It actually has an effect at that level of how you approach things. Terrible example in the, uh, the United States recently. We've had a lot of debates about the nature of grace. And there was a particular uh, character became very famous for preaching this radical view of grace. And I, I would say it's obvious in retrospect why he was doing that. Because he was living the double life as a sexual predator. And his preaching, his theology, flowed from his character. Flowed from his character at that point. There's a tendency in our age to downplay character and emphasize technical accomplishment. When one's going to write a book on preaching, typically you're going to, you think we're going to write a book on, well, how do you move from biblical text to exegesis to doctrinal synthesis to application? Those kind of moves. For the reformers and for those before them, character was also very important as well. And the tendency to downplay character and emphasize technical accomplishment, I think, is a pathology of our age. And it's something we need to address. I don't know how ordination or ministry works in the Sydney Diocese. There is a, a peculiarity in Presbyterianism that is a really weak flaw. And the peculiarity is this. The seminaries rightly say that when somebody gets an MDiv from the, uh, from the seminary, we are simply saying that their check cashed, they did all the necessary courses, and they passed the exams. We are not saying they're qualified for ordination. That's the task of the church. But the churches, I think, make the quite reasonable assumption that when a seminary issues somebody a pastoral qualification, that person is qualified for pastoral ministry. The result is nobody takes responsibility for the character issue in ministry and ministerial education. I don't know Sydney Diocese, but I have a suspicion you probably have your own equivalent of that disconnect. Most denominations which I'm familiar do. <clears throat> Listen to what the Westminster Director of Public Worship, 1645, says about qualifications for ministry. It is presupposed, according to the rules for ordination, 
that the minister of Christ is in some good measure gifted for so weighty a service by his skill in the original languages and in such arts and sciences as are handmaids unto divinity, by his knowledge in the whole body of divinity, but most of all in the holy scriptures. It's all technical stuff so far. But then he goes on to say, having his senses and heart exercised in them above the common sort of believers. And by the illumination of God's spirit and other gifts of education, which together with the reading and studying of the word, he ought still to seek by prayer and a humble heart, resolving to admit and receive any truth not yet attained, whenever God shall make it known to him, all of which he is to make use of and improve in his private preparations before he deliver in public what he hath provided. It's a brilliant statement, I think. It's, uh, it rarely, I think, do you find a statement for the qualifications for ministry so succinctly put, because it does not neglect the technical skills in languages, theology, etc., etc., but it weaves them in inextricably with character issues as well. Often, uh, I think, and I think there is a, a significant parallel between Sydney Anglicanism and Orthodox Presbyterianism of the denomination I belong to, and that is we have a tremendous fear of pietism because we fear it can lead to legalism or it can lead to unhealthy introspection. We have a suspicion of experience because we know that experience can be deceptive. We must not allow that to distract us from the truly experiential in terms of character, I think. That is vitally important. One of the wonderful things being here this week is witnessing the, uh, the community at Moore, which is very, very powerful, it seems to me, and provides uh, a wonderful context for the development of character. Uh, even if all of you perhaps don't avail yourself of that, I don't know. It's a big room. There are probably one or two miscreants out there. I don't know who you are, but I know you're there kind of thing. But it's important that the development of character is taken seriously. Um, listen to how the larger catechism describes preaching, how we are to preach. Question 159 of the larger catechism. How is the word of God to be preached by those that are called thereunto? Answer. They that are called to labor in the ministry of the word are to preach sound doctrine diligently, in season and out of season, plainly, not in the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, faithfully making known the whole counsel of God, wisely applying themselves to the necessities and capacities of the hearers, zealously with fervent love to God and the souls of his people, sincerely aiming at his glory and their conversion, edification and salvation. Again, notice the brilliant meshing of the technical. The, the catechist is basically saying, know your audience, speak plainly in a way they can understand, but do it fervently, passionately, with a deep desire for the glory of God and for the souls of the people. And the catechist doesn't let the congregants off the hook. I'm going to talk a bit about the congregants uh, tomorrow. Question 160, what is required of those that hear the word preached? And by the way, this goes to the heart of another of the things I abominate. And that is when people talk about, uh, you know, oh, well, at traditional Protestant churches, there's just one guy up the front and does it all. Absolute nonsense. As if hearing was a passive exercise in the church. Listen to how you are meant to hear the word of God preached. What is required of those that hear the word preached? Answer. It is required of those that hear the word preached that they attend upon it with diligence, preparation, and prayer. Examine what they hear by the scriptures. Receive the truth with faith, love, meekness, and readiness of mind as the word of God. Meditate and confer of it. Hide it in their hearts and bring forth the fruit of it in their lives. Nothing passive there. whole heap of things that we're meant to do when we sit and hear the word of God proclaimed. So character, I think, is very, very important. And it's useful at this stage, I think, to remind ourselves of what are the character qualifications in the New Testament for office bearing. 1 Timothy 3, I think, is as good a place to start as, as anywhere. And we see all of these, I think, exemplified in the way the reformers go about reformation. First of all, we're told that uh, elders, presbyters, 
uh, must be moderate in temperament. Moderate in temperament is vital, isn't it, to avoid unnecessary church splits. Every minister needs to know that not every hill is worth dying on. Luther, I think. Luther's an interesting character, isn't he? Because you don't often think of Luther as moderate in temperament. There's that, if you've not seen it, there's that great Luther insult generator on the web. You know, and you just press the button and it'll pop up some uh, insult drawn from Luther's writings that you can stick in that email to the person you're trying to whack. Um, <clears throat> Luther, we think of as not a man of moderate temperament. But actually... I would say, I would make this distinction in Luther, and I wonder if, if, I'll have to ask Mark, after if he disagrees. I think Luther is impatient and immoderate with those he thinks should know better, and incredibly moderate and patient with those that he knows don't know better. A great example of this is his letter on prayer, the little treatise on prayer, which remains, I think, one of the best things written on prayer, was written for his hairdresser who told him one day he was struggling with his prayer life, Peter Beskendorf. It's a wonderfully gentle and pastoral text. Um, Calvin, not a man we often think of as moderate. Read some of his pastoral letters. Read his letters to Renée of France when her Roman Catholic husband forces her back into the Roman Catholic Church. You expect Calvin to be all over that. He writes a wonderful letter wonderful pastoral letter to her, understanding the situation in which she finds herself. Luther wants a vernacular liturgy from 1520. He does not introduce one until 1525. Five years. Five years. Why does he wait that long? Well, one, he wants to make sure that the music for a German mass is German music. Music is important. Luther, of all the reformers, understands the power of music and the importance of getting it right. Would have been a Zeppelin man, I'm sure would have backed me on that question earlier. Though during his Anfechtung and maybe Dark Side of the Moon might have been the place where he would go. <laughs> but also, he does not want the ordinary people overly disturbed. There is a gradualism to Luther's Reformation that speaks of the moderate nature of his pastoral heart. There is a contrast, I think, that could be drawn between Luther and uh, his one-time friend and uh, later enemy, Andreas Bodenstein von Karlstadt, at the level of character. Karlstadt is a hothead. Luther is a man pastorally of moderate temperament. Polemically, not so much when he's taking on his enemies, but pastorally, a man of remarkably moderate temperament. Connected to that, of course, uh, Paul points towards the need for personal integrity, the need to manage their own households and families well. Think about that. Household management, that's a technical skill, which is grounded really, I think, in moral competence. The ability to stand up to your own children, that's a moral qualification. Again, think of Luther. You know, Luther's family. Now, we need, I need to be careful here. Certainly in Britain, for, for many, you know, many great evangelical leaders I can think of who were never married. You know, John Stott, Charles Simeon, they're the, the obvious names. Uh, I don't think uh, Paul is teaching you've got to be married to be a pastor, you have to have the kind of skill set that would make you a good household manager. But being a father definitely changed Luther. He was the first man in history, I think, to write a question and answer catechism after first being a parent. Read his small catechism. By the way, just as an aside, I would strongly recommend collect confessions and catechisms. You know, they don't have to be of your tradition at all. You will not find books with more bang, theological bang for your buck than creeds and confessions. Get hold of the Westminster Standards. Get hold of the 39 Articles, the Book of Common Prayer. Get hold of the Lutheran Book of Concord. These are great summaries of what Christians have believed throughout the ages and incredibly helpful. And Luther's small catechism is a masterpiece because you read it and it has a childlike quality to it. 
you're a parent, you go out into the woods with your child, perhaps, and the child points at something and says, what's that? You say, well, that's a squirrel. Next question, well, what does a squirrel do? That's how Luther's catechism is framed. And it also feeds into his philosophy of the pastoral ministry and of preaching. Christians, for Luther, are always to be like little children. Luther is fascinated by his own children, the utter dependence they have upon the word of their parents is to be a paradigm for the utter dependence Christians are to have on the word of their heavenly father. Good household management, solid grasp of the gospel should go without saying, consonant with the word and with doctrinal confession as being constitutive of the church. No one should hold office in the church who does not have a solid grasp of orthodox doctrine. That is how churches are destroyed. Because by very definition at that point, you are allowing a divisive person, one who wishes to deviate from the true doctrine, into a position of authority. And that is a real problem. Mustn't be new converts, Paul says. Again, I think one of the most obscurest verses in the Bible these days is, let no man despise you because of your youth. Incomprehensible today, isn't it? that anyone would be despised because of their youth. That's why we ask people like Justin Bieber for their profound thoughts on the most complex matters of social and economic policy. <laughs> you know, we, assume, we assume that youth equals wisdom and that age spoils you. That age spoils you. I think one of the things that we see in the New Testament and one of the things that comes through in the Reformation is that age and experience count. Again, we have an odd pathology in Presbyterianism. I don't know if you have your equivalent of this, but uh, a few years ago, I brought a couple of guys forward for ordination of the eldership in my church in their early 30s. And we received some pushback from members of the congregation. They're only in their early 30s. They're very young. Then I pointed out that they were exactly the same age as a number of men in the ministry in the area in which my church is who were respected ministers. An odd disconnect that we'll give the ministry of word and sacrament to young men with MDivs or BDs without question because we assume the MDiv gives them the competence to do it. And elders drawn from the non-theological constituency have to be much older. That's not biblical, simply not biblical. And good reputation with those outside. In short, one might say that the officers of the church are to model in life and doctrine that to which all Christians aspire. Character issues are central. They are central, of course, because the problems in the church are ultimately not technical in nature. This is the big divide at the Reformation, I think. One of the terms I try to abolish in my Reformation classes, though I occasionally fall into using it myself, is the Counter-Reformation. Because what I want to draw people to see in the 16th century is there are a lot of people in the Catholic Church at the start of the 16th century upset about what's going on. But there are different models of reform being proposed. And some of those models of reform, I would say, are technical models. We just need to change the way we train priests, and we need to reform the bureaucracy. The reformers, I think, saw a different model of reformation that the problem in the church was ultimately not caused by administrative or bureaucratic failure. It was caused by serious doctrinal slash moral failure. And the moral failure could not be sorted out without the doctrinal failure being sorted out. False teaching is critical to the problems in the church. And false teaching, I think, as Paul lays out in his pastoral epistles and has become clear in the Reformation, has to be solved in a holistic way. Proper teaching and proper moral lives. Character is crucial to competence in the church. <clears throat> 
And that brings me then to my three brief conclusions and one uh, follow-up point that I'm going to pick up tomorrow. First of all, I think we need to recover something that the reformers took for granted but we have lost. And that is that scriptural interpretation is a moral action. And character formation is a part of that. Scriptural interpretation is a moral action. And character formation is a vital part of that. Secondly, I think this is just a piece of basic practical advice. The authority of the preacher is bound up to a significant degree with the preacher's own public moral integrity. Uh, we need to make a distinction there. The word is the word, no matter who preaches it. The Donatist controversy in the early church makes the point that, that God's actions are God's actions even when conducted by a sinful person. And there's tremendous encouragement to be had from that. Ultimately, the power of my preaching on a Sunday does not rest in my moral perfection. The power of preaching, the burden of the last two lectures being the power of preaching rests in the fact that the word of God preached is the word of God. But I think we have to acknowledge that the word of God can be hindered by the public moral crises of those in the ministry. And thirdly, I want to suggest, I want to say that preaching and teaching are ecclesiastical actions in the sense that the content is to be regulated by Scripture and connected to the duly appointed leadership of the church, a leadership appointed because of its competence in precisely this area. That going back to that question, how do we balance, you know, the preacher as the preacher of God's word with giving critical feedback? Well, if the preacher is a man you respect then that balance should be fairly easy to strike. And the preacher will be a man you respect if he has the appropriate qualifications for the office which he holds. So I think office bearing is very important on that. Finally, and this is where I'm really pointing towards tomorrow, final point, how do we form character? Well, Luther has an answer to that too. We pray... We meditate and we are tested. And it's that to which I want to come to tomorrow. I'll take some questions. Yes. Uh, for those in the house, please uh, raise your hand and indicate the uh, microphones will come round to you. Uh, we are looking mostly for questions. Uh, rather than words of personal testimony or prophecy. <laughs> so uh, please uh, make your questions succinct uh, and to the point. Uh, if not for the speaker's sake, certainly for the sake of those who are following on online, who are uh, not here with us and enjoying the uh, rest of the context of our interactions. So uh, firstly, here down the front. <clears throat> Carl, could you comment on distance education when it comes to the development of character and the giving of a student a ministerial qualification when we as their educators have basically only known them through a computer screen? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not a big fan of distance education, partly because I was the last guy at my school to study Latin and the last guy not to do computer science, so I'm very inept technologically. Uh, <clears throat> I think, I remember one of my now, dare, he's died, one of my colleagues at Westminster, Manny Ortiz, commenting that seminary is the people you sit next to in the classroom. And he was making the point there that personal interactions uh, shape you and also provide you with friendships for life. You know, he was still in touch with men that, and women that he'd been at seminary with who were able to give him great advice and help during his ministry. So I think that's something that would be, would be lost. I do think that it's, it's not necessarily... Well, I, I, I think bodies are important. Being present with people is important. That shapes and forms us. 
Just because it isn't happening in distance education doesn't mean that it, it won't be happening. And I would want to say that for all of the, the beauty of the, the Moore community, as I've witnessed it these last two weeks, I would still hope that the primary location in, in which people's Christian character is being formed is the congregation you belong to, the people you're with on a Sunday, the people perhaps you're with during the week for Bible study, the people uh, that you call for diaconal help when, when you've got problems. So I think it's, if you like, students at Moore have a tremendous bonus and extra opportunity, but it doesn't mean that if you're not at a college like Moore, you don't have opportunities for Christian character formation, because I think Christian character is primarily formed in the congregation in which you find yourself. And of course, that tracks back to one of the underlying things this week has been, I think the preach word is very important, and sitting under the preaching of the word week by week shapes and transforms us. Sometimes students will say to me, but how can that be? Uh, I, I, I barely remember any sermons I preached. And you know, I forgot, I've lost count of the number of times when people will say to me, what does this verse mean? And I'll say, well, I preached on that two years ago, but I'll have to go and look at my notes and remind myself of what I believe about it. I don't even remember my own sermons that well. And I preach them. Uh, but the, the analogy I draw there is with, with, with schooling. Uh, I did classics. I can read Latin decently well. I can recall no specific Latin class I ever sat in my entire life. But you throw me a piece of Virgil and I'll do a half-decent job of translating it for you. Those classes made a difference. They shaped my mind. And I think that the regular preaching of the word transforms us incrementally in ways that we don't necessarily detect or understand but which takes place, really takes place over a period of time. So distance ed, I think one of the things that it loses is that classroom component of character formation, but that doesn't necessarily, it certainly does not mean that it shouldn't be taking place because I think the church should be the big place where it takes place. Everything else is a bonus, if you like. Uh, yes, over here. Okay, um, this question is more from yesterday. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that not as a rule, but as a preference, you would want children to be a part of the service with adults yeah. so they can hear the preacher yeah. and be conf confronted. I uh, just want to hear your thoughts on whether you consider in the Sunday school context a kid's talk to be preaching and confrontational in the same nature. <clears throat> yeah, it's a good question. Uh, and in, to some extent, it doesn't occur in my context because the kids are in the, are, are, are in the worship service. So I have to sort of think a bit on the hoof here. First of all, my wife wants me to add a qualification to what I said yesterday, that what I described as the practice of the Free Church of Scotland is only the practice of some free churches of Scotland, the ones I've been associated with. There are free churches, such as the one she grew up in, where she not only had to go to Sunday school, she also had to go and hear the preacher on a Sunday as well. Uh, I think that... Sunday school teaching is, well, first of all, I want to say it's obviously not teaching that should take place out with the context of the regulation of the church leadership. The Bible, the word is being taught there. So clearly the elders have to know who's teaching, trust what they're teaching, know that they're teaching orthodoxy. So I'd want to, first of all, give that a context. And for example, it's the way with our church, we always approve Sunday school material as a session. We trust the Sunday school superintendent to guide us on that. We put him in place because we know he's a good guy. But we always have oversight over the material that's being taught. Same with the women's Bible study. We appointed a great woman to lead the Bible study for us. When they change, study a new book, she'll shoot me an email saying, hey, we, we've, we've decided we'd like to study this book. Is that okay with the elders? I've always, I've never been asked that question and not been able to sign off on it. But I have signed off on it so that if something goes wrong, I, I have to take responsibility. Um, I think the, the teaching of children is, if it is, if it is replacing a sermon, then yes, I think one would have to make it more confrontational in the qualified sense I said yesterday, because children need to be confronted with the claims of the gospel. Uh, if it's not replacing the sermon, then I think it can fulfill a variety of other functions. Familiarizing children with the Bible story might be sufficient, for example. 
Um, the other thing I would add about, I, I mentioned this yesterday, I think that when you, when you don't have children in the worship service, and this is not a, a killer argument against that practice, but it's a, you then do have to make a somewhat arbitrary decision about when they are to be introduced into the worship service. Uh, which will be a somewhat arbitrary decision. But if they're not sitting under the preaching of the word, then yes, I think the Sunday school message has to have something of that charismatic content to it. I would say, though, that for preachers who, are, who have children in the worship service when they preach, they need to be aware of that as well and make sure that the sermon is, has something that is accessible to the children. Back then. Hi, Carl. You mentioned yesterday that character is not taught, but it is learned. And I was wondering what advice you would give um, seminary students, people working towards pastoral uh, ministry in a full-time context for learning character. What advice would you give students? Find good role models. Uh, make friends with people of an older generation. That kind of thing. One of the things that my wife, has, Katrina, has noticed this more than I have. One of the things she's noticed is uh, that a lot of young people seem these days to turn to other young people for advice. I think that's not good. <laughs> you're sort of pooling your ignorance at that point. Uh, uh, you know, if you're a young parent with a, with a young family, who are the best people to talk to about parenting? The older couple who've done it well. You can learn from their strengths and their mistakes. So I would say good role models is first and foremost one thing. Secondly, I think humble service. Everybody in the church should be involved. I mean, my church is so small, everybody has to do pretty menial tasks. I have to take the trash out every now and then. Uh, a friend of mine, a minister friend of mine said to me, if a minister doesn't know where the toilet plunger is in his church, you know, he needs to find out because that shows that he's, he's raising himself above the people at that point. Uh, it's a silly example, but I think humble, finding avenues of humble service, just because your head is full of knowledge doesn't exempt you. Uh, for me, uh, when I was in my early years as a professor at Westminster, when, uh, before I was pastor of Cornerstone Church, I assisted my wife in teaching the three- to four-year-old Sunday school. You know, I wore a silly hat each Sunday, and I taught the Bible story to the little children. And that was very formative experience for me. I'm used to being in a classroom of people who you know, can read and write, hopefully. Uh, they are Americans, so we have to make some allowances. <laughs> but uh, um, I, I'm usually in a classroom of intelligent people who can, who can handle the material I'm throwing at them. Three and four year olds, not so. I had to think very hard. And they can ask some very humbling questions. So I, I think self-consciously seeking avenues of humble service. Just because you've got a PhD doesn't mean you shouldn't take the trash out in your church. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be involved in teaching the little kids in your church. Um, so I think humble service is a very, very important part of, of church. Uh, one of the, the things that most disillusion me sometimes when students turn up at church is you get the students who come and the first thing they want to know is, you know, basically, when are you going to let me in the pulpit? When can I lead worship or something like that? Well, we have a rule at our church. We don't allow any student to do that until they've been in the church for a year. And that's so that we can establish that they're actually committed to us as a congregation rather than they're coming to us to find out what we can do for them. So I, I think be very self-conscious in seeking out good role models, older role models, and humble avenues of service in the church. <clears throat> yeah, Chris? I'm just wondering, did Luther's emphasis on Christianity as fundamentally a religion of assertions um, and not a way of life, mm -hmm. did that ultimately pave the way to the problem that you're elucidating, this issue of character. It's all sort of intellectual and it's all assertions as opposed to Erasmus's emphasis on way of life. Yeah, I think it could do. I, I mean, I'm hesitant to blame Luther for the sins of, of his descendants, if I could put it that way. But I think in Protestantism, our appropriate doctrinal emphasis, and I, I do believe that's right, that's where we need to, to see our foundation, 
has to be seen as leading to a working out in our lives. And this is one of the things that, you know, Luther is so shocked. In, in 1527, the, the Reformation is, is entering its real consolidation phase. It's no longer making the rapid gains that it was. And Luther is beginning to realize we're in this for the long haul. Jesus isn't going to return tomorrow. We've got to start organizing. And they have a, a visitation of Electoral Saxony where they send out teams of four men, two representatives of the civil magistrate and two representatives of the church, visit each parish and bring a report back. And Luther's horrified. I'm going to talk about this a little bit tomorrow. Luther's horrified by what comes back. He's basically said, we, we're preaching the gospel now and the people live like irrational pigs. It's not making any difference at all. So I think there is, there is a danger in Protestantism of becoming over-cerebral. And that's, to me, where character becomes important. We, we have to remember that character is important too. It goes back to my, my humble service comment there. Uh, the responsibility lies with us to make sure that Protestantism doesn't become an intellectual exercise. And I'll talk about this tomorrow. I mean, Luther's whole concept of, of testing or temptation really is what guards him from... In, Christianity becoming just an intellectual exercise. But it is something we can tend to forget. And often Protestantism, because it is bookish, because it is doctrinal, attracts bookish, intellectual types of people who tend to downplay sometimes the practical. So I think there's, a, there's in, perhaps an innate tendency in Protestant culture to move in that direction. Um, so yes... I think Luther can be used that way. It's an inappropriate use of him. But it's a danger that we need to be aware of. <clears throat> Dr. Truman, given the centrality of character, are there dangers involved in weighing people's teaching without access to their lives? And if so, do you have any wisdom in mitigating those dangers? Um, well, strictly speaking, the truth of what a man says is not determined by his character. Two plus two equals four, whether you're a serial killer or Mother Teresa. Yeah, you, you don't need that. So, and I think that, that, that God's truth, praise God, is like that. But the truth of the word doesn't depend upon me being sinlessly perfect. Otherwise, I would never be able to preach a true sermon. But I, as I've sort of tried to lay out, I think... There are credibility issues. You know, Paul says of good reputation with those outside. And that's always intrigued me as a qualification because, to be honest, in my circles, that's the one qualification we never actually seem to check up on. We never take references from somebody's neighbor before we ordain them. You know, is he a good neighbor? But Paul puts that in there. Why does he put it in there? Because I think bad character can obscure and even undermine a man's message. I think of my own father, who was one time, was in, he, as far as I know, he was not a Christian when he died, but as a younger man, was interested in Christianity and was attending a Bible study run by a friend of his. And my own father was an orphan, so for him, family was everything. When he had a family, that was everything. This guy, this Bible study leader, this minister, uh, committed adultery, ran off, left his wife and children. Uh, I don't think my father ever opened a Bible from that day on. Now, you know, if my father died as not a Christian, well, he has to stand and answer for his life. Uh, he can't blame his friend. But his friend will have to answer, I think, for obscuring and damaging the testimony of the church and the gospel in a serious way. Um, how do we, you were sort of, how do we guard against what, what was the precise nub of the question? Um, uh, if, if there are dangers in yeah. weighing teaching without access to the life, do you have wisdom in sort of mitigating those dangers? Okay. Uh, the answer on that is probably really no. Uh, I think you need to seek the scriptures. If you don't have access to somebody's life, then presumably the life is neither strengthening nor undermining what they're saying, and therefore seek the scriptures and see if these things are so. Search the scriptures, see if these things are so. <clears throat> I'll just follow on that, that question. Um, how would you counsel someone who's heard good preaching from a pastor and then that pastor 
then falls into like a disqualifying sin. Yeah. Um, so just from personal experience, yeah. Yeah, that can be very devastating. Uh, when somebody has, has uh, been listening to good preaching, perhaps been heavily influenced by somebody's ministry, and then that pastor falls into serious sin, that's where I think theology becomes acutely imp- of, of acute practical importance. Uh, I, I think it's important then to be able to emphasize that the validity and strength of the person's teaching did not depend upon their character. Uh, I mean, I experienced this myself with Roy Clements. You know, Roy Clements, I learned a huge amount from Roy Clements. Years after I left Cambridge, he fell into very serious sin, of which I believe he's not so far repented. Um, and it leaves me with the question of what do, I, you know, what do I do with the Roy Clements book on my shelf? Can I not learn from it anymore? I can, yes, I can learn from it, because even Balaam's ass speaks truth. Uh, you know, an extreme example. If, if a man's arguments are true, they're true. But cancelling somebody on that front can be hard. And again, I think it would probably depend there on the maturity of the Christian you were counseling. When I heard about Roy Clements's fall, I was sort of old enough at that point. Yeah, I'd seen this happen before. And while it, it was heartbreaking, it didn't substantially shake my faith. There's an element, there is an element when you know your own heart of thinking, well, wow, if it can happen to him, I need to guard my heart extra carefully because it can happen to anybody. Uh, if you're talking to somebody young in the faith, then I think one would want to uh, be obviously gentle in the way one approached it, but also try to encourage them to think about separating the man from the truth that he preached. So it would depend somewhat on, on the person you're connecting to. And there might be a great example of, I, I would say, that's probably where speaking to an older person is going to be very helpful. You know, if it happens at university, chatting to your 21-year-old friend It might be the first time they've ever experienced it. I guarantee you, if you talk to somebody who's been a Christian for 30 years, they will have seen it at least once. They will probably have experienced it in their fairly close circle. Uh, It's impossible, sadly, to be around in the Christian world for very long without having very close experience of of that sort of disaster. I I can think of, I think, four friends, even in the last decade, ministers who've committed adultery and had to leave the ministry, and some of them have left the faith. Uh, Thank you, uh, Carl. Um, We're speaking today about uh, uh, teaching and particularly learning character. Uh, You hinted, I think, in a previous lecture about the uh, deficiencies in preacher training generally. Just wondering if you can um, speak to, uh, share with us any uh, experiences and particularly encouragements that you might have in terms of preacher training, things that you've seen in your denomination, your experience, and from the Ministry of the Reformers. The things that, in the, in the, in the young preachers I've seen coming through Westminster, and I, I, I'm guessing it's pretty similar here. Uh, By and large, the, the strength is they're very concerned not to say anything that isn't true, if I put it that way. So they work very hard on making sure that their exegesis of the text is accurate and they're not drawing anything from the text that they shouldn't draw. Uh, where I find weakness is, a, a, a perennial weakness in passion and engagement, structure, uh, they often seem to sermons young, uh, of, of young preachers seem to lack clear structure. I think they tend to assume that what is clear to them on the page is necessarily going to be clear to their audience who don't have access to their, their inner thoughts. Uh, I do think that preaching is something that can only be learned by doing it in a proper context. So I think there needs to be a closer partnership between churches and seminaries and theological colleges on preaching and probably on other aspects as well I mean ladies leading Bible studies or women speaking in front of other women I think these things are learned their skills that are learned by actually doing them you can't learn them from the book you can't even learn them from a preaching lab so I think a, a closer connection between church and seminary is important on that front um, I think that pre- a good I, I think Students need, when they listen to preaching, not only to hear what's being preached, but occasionally to reflect on what's being done so they can actually learn. Oh, yeah, that, he said that at the beginning because it laid out the structure of everything he was going to say thereafter and gave people a map. 
So I think being more self-conscious hearers of sermons is a good thing too. Yes, Ben. <clears throat> morning. Thanks, Carl. I'm just reflecting on a comment yesterday. Uh, I think you said that God is only actively present when his word is read and proclaimed. I'm just wondering on the bearing of God's, well, his omnipresence and his providence. Yeah. So thinking yeah. just as an example of Psalm 139, if I go up to heaven, you are there. Even there, your hand will lead me, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, certainly, I, I don't want to deny that God's present everywhere. I think I made that qualification uh, right at the start. I said, you know, when I'm talking about presence, I'm not talking about what I call a sort of met bare metaphysical presence, sustaining all things. If I said that God is only present in the, procl- in the reading and proclamation, if he's only actively present, then I overspoke. I think what I would, quali- I would qualify that by saying that God is normally actively present only in the proclamation and speaking of his word, but clearly he guides us by providence. Clearly there are times when there are uh, miraculous providences. I don't like using the language of intervention because that does seem to me to imply absence of God. Other than when I was only in America, I, was at a, I gave a talk on, it was on same-sex marriage, I think, and then at the end, the question and answer was brought to an end, and somebody stood up and said, I have a question to ask, which is always a bad sign when, when it's been brought to an end. And it wasn't a question, it was a statement how God had intervened on Tuesday, November the 6th, to bring Donald Trump in as president to make sure Hillary Clinton didn't get it. And, uh, and he asked me what I thought of that, and I said, well, I don't think God intervenes. Uh, I don't think God woke up late on Monday night and thought, crikey, O'Reilly, Hillary Clinton's about to be elected. I need to do something, you know. I need to get down there and fix the ballot. Uh, It was part of God's active providence. So don't want to deny that God is actively working there. But there is a special direct impacting way of presence in the word, I think, that is not normally there in other things. That's why, you know, as a Presbyterian, I love the word normally. Because it allows me to say, well, yeah, of course, all these other things can happen. But normally, it's done this way. It's also a good word for administrators drafting policies that they don't want to apply to themselves, in my experience. <laughs>